Hurricanes are terrifying in part because they unfold in slow motion. Scientists watch them form out at sea, growing ever bigger and more powerful. Then they do their best to predict where the storm might make landfall and how powerful it might be. But predicting hurricanes is very difficult. So how do scientists track and predict hurricanes? To find out, we sat down with a hurricane hunter who flies planes into the heart of these massive storms. My name is Jason Dunyan and I'm a research meteorologist with NOAA's Hurricane Research Division and with the University of Miami. Why would you fly a big, very expensive airplane anywhere near a hurricane? So that's a great question. We have a couple of different hurricane hunters that we like to fly. We do have a high altitude Gulfstream jet that we fly at about 45,000 feet around the storm, so we don't get too close with that plane. But we do have two P3s, so they're P3 Orions. It's an old Navy sub hunter. So it's made to take a beating. It's made to fly low and hard over the ocean. If we just have satellites, maybe a couple of ship observations out over the ocean, you can almost think of that stage as kind of the low definition stage where we've got good information, but we don't have the best information. You know, flash forward to when we're doing hurricane reconnaissance, if the storm gets close enough and we really want to start picking it apart, then we start taking our aircraft with all the instruments that we have and you kind of turn a low definition situation into a, a maybe a 4K, where now we can get a, a full look at the storm, we're feeding the models all this extra data, so things really start to change once we start getting the aircraft out there and, and really starting to pick the storm apart. What does it feel like to fly an aircraft so near to a hurricane? You can get updrafts that will raise the plane up a few hundred feet in a matter of seconds, downdrafts that push you down, and you can actually get zero gravity. Things start to, to kind of float uh, for a few seconds while you're, of course, while you're strapped in. And then you pop into this eye. In this case, it was about 10 or 12 miles across, and it's complete calm. The clouds break, you've gone from 200 mile per hour winds to maybe five mile per hour winds. And you can, you can even get out of your seat, take some pictures, uh, walk around, knowing that you're in the middle of the storm and if you want to get back out again, you've got to cut through you know, the other side of the hurricane. So the, that flight sounds pretty dangerous. Um, how do you ensure that everybody in the plane is staying safe? Up at the cockpit, there are actually two pilots and a flight engineer. So everyone is, a, is adjusting for the storm and the flight engineer is actually adjusting the engines, whether we need to go faster or slower. So navigators, the meteorologists are trying to look ahead at you know what could be a, a more tricky part of the storm as we're cutting through it. So when you put those 19 folks together, it becomes a safer environment because we all really understand these storms because we've been flying them for so long. With that said, it, it's still not sit, like sitting in your couch at night watching TV, it's a little bit more exciting than that for sure. And what kind of data are these aircraft and it seems now uh, more so drones that you're deploying as well, uh, what kind of data are they collecting that are useful for building out these models? We have uh, very complex instruments that we take on board. We have little drop-sons that launch out of the planes with a little parachute pops open. They're measuring temperature, pressure, humidity, winds, everything we want to know about the storm. And some of our planes actually have a tail Doppler radar that's rotating. And it's actually, almost think of it as a CAT scan of the storm. So suddenly you're able to paint the wind field from just above the ocean surface all the way up to the top of the storm up near the stratosphere. We have a microwave instrument that actually looks at the state of the sea surface and gives us a wind speed. And that's the all important information that we want to get to the hurricane center because you know, winds up at 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, they're important for forecasts, but really, what does it matter for folks on the ground? We want to know what the winds are down at the surface. And can we talk about the models? How do these work? How are you plugging in data, that sort of thing, to, to build these predictions for hurricanes? We have several models. Some of them look on the global scale. Um, some of them look more what we call a meso scale, where they're just focused in on over the storm, what the, what the storm environment looks like. But what, what has really advanced in recent years is what we call data assimilation. So we're collecting all these observations, you know, this 4K high def look, all these observations from our hurricane hunters. But if the models don't know how to use that data and really assimilate it into their forecast, it's really a waste. So there have been some really incredible advancements as far as how do the models take that data in and how do they continuously use it to make their forecasts that go out you know, a few weeks? What do you need to have in order for these things to form? 
warm sea surface temperatures, really moist air in the mid-levels, say at about maybe 10,000 feet or so. Kind of favorable winds. If the winds are too strong, it can kind of rip the storm apart. You know, if you go back to the breeding ground over Africa, just south of the Sahara Desert, that's really the nursery for a lot of these storms. You, we get these rotating thunderstorms that kind of march across the continent. When they come off the coast, they start to bubble up a little bit, you start to see more clouds, more convection, and as that storm, that thunderstorm starts to grow, it starts to draw in more energy, more winds at the low levels, and it almost starts to breathe. You start to have air rushing in down low, rising up near the center, and then out at the top. So you can almost think of it as this, this breathing engine that if the conditions are right, it, it can really start to ramp up. Why is it so important to you know, peg down not only the direction of the hurricane, the path that it's taking, but also the intensity? How does that then inform efforts on the ground in preparation for landfall? If you don't have a good track for the storm and you, and you put the storm in the wrong place, you're going to have all different predictors. Right? It could be in a, in a colder ocean area. So they kind of come together into this, this all-important forecast where the track and the intensity are, are really closely tied. It's not just the winds that can reach you know, a, a weak tornado strength, actually, in some of these stronger storms, but it's the inland flooding that can, you know, we can get 10, 20 inches, 30 inches of rain in some of these events that can cause a lot of destruction and even loss of life. And even the storm surge where people are kind of caught along the coast. So you're, you're looking at these extreme events. And if you're looking at, at these category fives, they're the rarest of the rare, where you can really start to affect life, um, loss, loss of property along those coastlines, where just by human nature, that's where we tend to flock. That's where people like to live. That's where people like to go on their vacations. So it becomes a, a really vulnerable part um, of, our, of our world are these coastlines where, of course, hurricanes tend to affect. So in these times of climate change, do we have a good idea yet of how that might be affecting, you know, first of all, maybe the way that these hurricanes are forming and maybe their intensity? You know, obviously, warmer waters is a, a big component of this, but what are we finding um, as the climate warms, how that might be affecting hurricanes? The, the climate question is really tricky with hurricanes because our record goes back about 100 years or so. And our really solid record where we have satellites and we've got aircraft reconnaissance, that goes back about 50 years. So, you know, you think about it's kind of a blink of an eye for Mother Nature for as long as we've been looking at these storms and really understanding them. But if we think about a changing environment where we might have warming. Certainly one thing would be warming sea surface temperatures, right? We know that's one of the pieces, the ingredients, the fuel for these storms. Some studies have suggested if we get into a warmer climate, looking at model simulations, that some parts of the world actually get drier in the middle levels of the atmosphere while some get moister. So there's maybe a little bit of a mixed signal there. We're not sure how that would play out. And I think you, you make it even more complicated when you put this, we know there's this background oscillations to these storms. It's multi-decadal, where we had a, kind of a quiet 60s and 70s, 80s, and all of a sudden things ramped up in the 90s and we're kind of in this, this more active era. So the question gets very complex when we look at all these competing ingredients for storms. Plus there's this natural background oscillation. And certainly lots more studies need to, need to be done to really try to take a crack at, at what a warming climate could mean for hurricanes. Yeah, and Dorian was interesting because it seemed to have slowed down significantly. Um, is that at all a function of climate change or has that been seen in the past? There are some interesting recent studies that have suggested that maybe some storms would start to slow as they approach the coast in a warming climate. I think it's too early to really put a a good handle on that and, and really say yes or no. One thing's for sure is in the Dorian case, we saw the steering currents basically break down as it approached the coast, which is kind of a worst case scenario for a place like the Bahamas where suddenly there's no forward motion. We have a, a major category five storm that, that's, that's really lost its steering currents and, and can cause a, a lot of storm surge and a lot of this destruction um, in, in the few days that it's kind of meandering over a certain area. Yeah, one of the interesting things I, I find about hurricanes is a lot of time you see it kind of steer up the, the coast of the eastern United States. What are the phenomena that might be driving that? Yeah, so one of the, we call it subtropical ridge. I mean, meteorologists love to have their fancy terms, but it's really just a high pressure system in the middle of the Atlantic. And that's kind of climatology where this high pressure is just kind of parked throughout the summer. And that helps to steer these storms generally from east to west 
from Africa all the way to the United States. But as they start to get to the western part of the basin, near Cuba, near Florida, they're kind of coming around the edge of that high pressure. So things can really start to change quickly. What comes next in hurricane science? Being able to predict rapid intensification better, or even rapid weakening, that's just as important. Rainfall forecasts, we know that, that rainfall is, can cause a lot of loss of life and property. Getting better forecasts from the models about where those big precipitation events might set up. And really continuing to develop observations that can go into those models. So whether it's using high altitude drones that we've tested out a little bit, like a drone called the Global Hawk, where we're flying in the stratosphere, sampling over the storm. So it's I think in the in the coming years we're looking at that two-way street where we continuously try to improve the types of observations, the type, types of pictures that we're providing of the storm, but we come up with models that can handle that information better and make better and better forecasts. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it.